All right. Uh, let's take our Bibles and let's turn to Romans chapter 15 tonight. And I'd like for you to go ahead and turn to Ephesians chapter number 2 as well. Romans chapter number 15 is our text uh, for this evening. We're going through the book of Romans and we're looking at uh, tonight uh, um, where we've been looking at the, the harmony in the church and we're looking at how there ought to be harmony. And last time we, we saw in verses 5 through 7 that believers are to be like-minded in a godly way toward one another. There in verse number 5, we saw that our like-minded, uh, our being like-minded toward one another is needed to properly glorify God according to verse number 6. And then we saw that this means that we are to receive one another as Christ also received us to the glory of God according to verse number 7. Now, uh, the, the verses we're looking at tonight is basically an extension of verse number 7. Uh, back during this time, there was uh, the great... I guess, divide between people. You know, we, we're all different, aren't we? We just are. I mean, when there's nobody, no two people that are in here that are the same. And, uh, you know, I may have some uh, features that get on your nerves, and you may have some that get on mine. Uh, but listen, we're to love one another. We're, we're part of the, we're part, part of, uh, of God's uh, church, and we are to uh, be in harmony, one, in one, one with another. And, and the same was true he, if, uh, what Paul was writing to the Romans and what he wrote to the Ephesians. Uh, back during this time, I mean, the church was a brand new thing. I mean, the, uh, the, the Jews used to be under the law, doing their own thing, doing their uh, Judaism uh, worship and, uh, at the temple. And uh, here the, uh, the Lord brought in these Gentiles into the same group. Okay? We're all one in Christ. And we're all saved by God's grace. And you couldn't get a more divide than there was between a Jew and Gentile. And, and uh, we're going to be taking a look at this and, and how that uh, uh, Jesus Christ had reference to both the Jew and the Gentile. Uh, you know, all the things that were prophesied of him in the Old Testament. It wasn't that he was just going to be the Messiah of the Jew. He's going to be the Messiah of us Gentiles as well. Amen. And we praise God that He is our, our Savior. And uh, tonight we're going to see the work of, of Jesus Christ was a work for all of us, no matter whether we're talking Jew or Gentile, or whether we're talking, uh, you know, uh, just differences in the way that we, we're made up. Amen. Christ saved us. And see, he sought me just as much as He sought you. And He saved me just like He saved you, and He put us together. And we're together in this thing uh, uh, called the church. And so we'll, we'll take a look at that tonight. Let's, uh, let's begin by, um, let's, let's read uh, ver the verses we're going to deal with, verses 8 through 14. And then we'll come back and take a look at this, but I, I also want to read in connection with this Ephesians chapter number 2 here in just a minute, uh, some verses from there. But Romans 15, verse number 8. Uh, Paul says here, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister uh, of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. He's talking about the Jews when he talks about the circumcision. okay? And, the, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy as it is written, For this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. Now, we're going to see several verses here that refer to the Old Testament says, and, uh, as it is written. If you want to, um, I'm not going to, we, we didn't, there's not enough here to uh, keep this thing, where well, there's actually too much here to keep it to two pages, like I like to do front and back on the, a, uh, a study sheet. Couldn't get it narrowed down. And so, um, you, if you want to know these verses, you can either write them down or you can understand that if you've got a, a uh, reference Bible, they're actually in the center reference and the, the, the numbers refer to them. Uh, uh, in, my, in my Bible, I've got here as it is written, uh, uh, I can I see there on the right-hand side is talking about Psalm 1849 and 2 Samuel 2250. I don't know what your Bible says, but if you've got a good reference Bible, which is a good thing to have, 
Th those are the places where that is written. Um, let's, let's read on, okay? Because he, he keeps saying, he keeps referring back to the Old, Old Testament. He says in verse 10, And again he saith, Rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. Uh, and again, Praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and laud him, all ye people. And again, Isaiah, or Isaiah saith, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles trust. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. And I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. Um, and so uh, we'll leave off reading there. Uh, look at Ephesians chapter number 2. And uh, let's take a look at uh, verses number 11 through the end of the chapter here. Verse number 11. And Paul is addressing this matter of that the Jew and Gentile are brought together within the church. And he says there in verse number 11, and he's writing to a mostly uh, Gentile congregation here. He says, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. In other words, uh, uh, uncircumcision is the Gentiles, circumcision is the Jews. It has to do with the right of, of, of circumcision. The, uh, and it says, verse 12, that at that time, okay, in, in time past, at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That was the condition of the Gentiles until Christ came. But look, verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus... Ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. And all God's Gentiles said, Amen, glory to God, hallelujah. I mean, right there. Uh, aren't you glad? Verse 14, For he, speaking of Christ, he is our peace, who hath made both one, or what both, both Jew and Gentile are made one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain a one new man, so making peace, and, and that he might reconcile both, again, Jew and Gentile, both unto God in one body, that's the church, by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, that's the Gentiles, and to them that were nigh, that's the Jews, for through him, uh, through Jesus, we both have access, uh, both meaning Jew and Gentile, have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners. Okay? As Gentiles, we're not strangers and foreigners anymore, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building, fitly framed together, groweth into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Christ uh, uh, does inhabit uh, the church, doesn't he? he? He indwells the church. And that's what he's speaking of there. Now, uh, Let's, let's go back to our uh, text. I wanted to read that in connection because it, this, the, you, you'll, you'll come to understand more of what we're going through in the book of Romans tonight. We're not going to go through Ephesians 2. We just want, I just wanted to make reference to it as we began there to, so that you can see the mindset is uh, Gentiles used to be way far away. Jews were, were nigh. Well, now we're one, both one. We're both near. Amen. And we were one in Christ Jesus. Now, um, Paul readily admits in verse number 8 there, Romans uh, 15, verse number 8, he says, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a, a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the Father. So let's break this down. 
He's talking about that Jesus Christ had reference to the Jew in His Word. Now when He says, now I say, He's affirming or maintaining that this to be true. He's, uh, he's saying, I, and Paul was a Jew, we know that, he admitted that Christ's work had reference to the Jews, and that's correct. And he says that Jesus, that Jesus Christ, or in other words, Jesus the Messiah, always understand that the word Christ in the New Testament is the same as Messiah or anointed one in the Old Testament. Okay? They, they all, mean, all three of those mean the same thing. Christ is the anointed one, Messiah the anointed one, and the anointed one is the anointed one. Okay, so you got, it's all the same. And Jesus Christ was that anointed one. Christ or Messiah is the name of Jesus' office. Uh, to say that Jesus is Christ or Messiah uh, to a Jew conveys more than the idea of a mere proper name. You know, it's not the same as saying, well, I'm Jerry Nelson Thrower. Lord Jesus Christ, it's not the same, okay? Uh, Jesus' office is that of being Messiah. Messiah or Christ points to the Old Testament prophecies related to the Anointed One, which is the meaning of Christ or Messiah. So uh, that's, uh, that's what it was pointing to. And then so that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision. That is, Jesus exercised His office the office of the Messiah among the Jews, and that, that is the meaning of the circumcision. Uh, he, he, he exercised that with respect to the Jews. Jesus, we know, was born a Jew. Amen? He was born a Jew. He was born into a family that was of the tribe of Judah. Uh, you can read the genealogies. I'm not going to take time to turn there. Matthew 1, verses 1 through 16, and Luke 3, verse 23 through 38, very clearly show that he came through the uh, line of Judah. And he was circumcised also according to Luke 2, 39. Luke 2, 39 talks about that everything was said that he was supposed to have done uh, it, it, according to the law. His parents made sure that it was done there on that eighth day when he was circumcised. Now, he came to the nation of of Israel. We know that. And he died in their midst without having gone himself to any other people. But understand that some people of other nations did come to him. Okay, We know we have some records. I didn't take time to, to look all the references up. But we know the, uh, that there are some Gentiles who came specifically. Let's talk about the uh, Roman centurion. He had a, had a sick servant. He was a Gentile. And he came and asked the Lord to heal him. And the Lord said, I have not seen such great faith, no, not in Israel. He, he, he found that, that uh, in the Gentiles. But, that, but he came to Jesus, okay? What I'm saying is that Jesus, when he came, he came to Israel. Uh, John 1, verse 11 and 12 says, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. And then uh, what we saw in Romans chapter number 9, when we studied it, Romans 9 verse 4 and 5, who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh, Christ came. Christ came in the flesh uh, uh, as a Jew and it says, who is over all, God bless forever, amen. So we know that Jesus was born a Jew, and he came uh, uh, to the nation of Israel, even though he was uh, rejected uh, there at the end. But uh, he came for the truth of God. That's the, the other part of that verse, verse number, verse number 8. Um, he, he came for the truth of God. The, ter the purpose for which Christ came was to confirm or establish the truth of the promises of God. Think about it. The Old Testament prof prophets prophesied of this anointed one that was going to come, the Messiah, and what he would do. And Christ came to fulfill what was said about him in the Old Testament. He, he established the truth of the promises of God. He, he remained among them in the exercise of this ministry to show that God was true 
who had said that the Messiah would come to them. And the Messiah did come to them, but uh, uh, largely the nation of Israel right now, we're talking about by and large, we're not talking about the remnant, but by and large the, 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 the nation of Israel is still looking for a Messiah. Messiah's come. Okay? And He's going to come again. And that's when they will... Uh, uh, many of them will come to Christ. I mean, what, that, what, what a blessing that's going to be. But um, he came for the, for the truth of God, and, and look at what else it says there in verse number 8, uh, to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. Or uh, we could say to establish or to show that the promises were true. And the promises referred to here are those particularly which related to the coming of the Messiah and by thus admitting that Messiah was the minister of the circumcision, the Apostle Paul here is conceded that uh, all that the Jew could ask, I mean, that he was to be peculiarly their Messiah. Uh, but Paul doesn't stop there, okay? Uh, he, he moves on. He's established that, that Christ is, uh, had, he had reference to the Jews, but then in verses 9 through 12, he spends one verse to say Jesus was, he, he came specifically to the Jew for the Jew. But he uses verses 9 through 12 here, and we see that Jesus, that Jesus Christ had reference to the Gentiles in his work as well. And he, he, he doesn't just give uh, one verse here. He gives multiple verses because he knows the Jew is stubborn. The Jew is not going to take this at face value. You know, don't, they didn't care that the Apostle Paul was a, a Jew. And they, you know, they don't even take his word for it. They needed, they needed uh, uh, Scripture, and he gives them that. Uh, there in verse number 9 says, "...and that the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy." As it is written, for this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy names. Now, uh, let's break this down. And that the Gentiles. Listen, the benefits of the gospel were not confined to the Jews. And as God designed that those benefits which should be extended to the Gentiles, so the Jewish converts ought to be willing to admit them and treat them as brethren. Hey, God, God let them in on the blessing of uh, uh, of the gospel. And if God let them in on the, with the blessing of the gospel, you ought to receive them according to the blessing of that gospel. Uh, that, that God did design this. Paul begins to show here. He says, uh, uh, and that the Gentiles. And here's the second phrase, might glorify God for His mercy. Glorify God there. Uh, might praise or give thanks to God. And that's, that's how we glorify God. I mean, we give, we give praise to God. We give thanks to God. Um, this implies that the favor shown to them was a great favor. Okay? The gospel is a great favor to all of us, Jew and Gentile alike. Um, the great favor is for His mercy. It means uh, on, a, on account of the mercy, mercy shown to them, I glorify God for His mercy. Because God showed mercy to the Gentiles, uh, they gave praise and gave thanks to God. Um, as it is written, and here, here's some more reference uh, to the Old Testament. The expression here is one of David's recorded in 2 Samuel 22.50 and also in Psalm 18.49. You'll find that David was saying that he will thank God for his mercies, talking about God's mercies, among the heathen. And in other words, when surrounded by the heathen, that is, he would confess and, and acknowledge the mercies of God to the heathen, or as we should, would say, to all the world. Okay? Uh, we're, we're, we're to go into all the world. And, and, the, and the, David was uh, all about taking and, and acknowledging the mercies of God even to those who uh, were heathen. Now, verse number 10, he says, And again he saith, Rejoice ye nations, uh, excuse me, rejoice ye Gentiles with uh, his people. And the reason I said nations is because I got it written out right beside there, nations. And the reason I have it, because it's, that's the way it's, it, it is um, uh, translated in the Old Testament. Okay? Um, 
Words, these are words, uh, let's see here. The, the, uh, words from the Song of Moses recorded in Deuteronomy 32, 43. Okay, I lost my place there real quick. But when it says there in verse 10, and again he saith, Rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. Though That's recorded in Moses' song uh, in Deuteronomy 32, 43. And in this place, uh, the, the nations or Gentiles are called on to rejoice with the Jews for the intervening of God in their behalf or on their behalf. Amen? Uh, the, the design of the quotation is to show that the Old Testament speaks of the Gentiles as called on to celebrate the praises of God as well. Okay? Uh, Paul infers that they are to be introduced to the same privileges as his people. Uh, verse number 11 says, And again, praise the Lord, all ye, all ye Gentiles, and laud him, all ye people. Uh, this is from Psalm 117 and verse number 1. Now, the object in this quotation is the same as before. The apostle accumulates quotations to show that it was the common language of the Old Testament and that this was not depending on a single expression for the truth of his doctrine. And by the way, if it, even if it did have one expression, God's truth uh, it's God's truth, even if it's one expression. But when it's got multiple expressions, it, it, it just uh, solidifies it even more. Um, but he, he, he says, and, and again, praise ye of the, the Lord, all ye Gentiles, Lord him, all ye people, all ye Gentiles. In the psalm, it says, all ye nations. But the meaning is the same. Okay, And Lord him uh, means praise him. The, the psalm is a call on all nations to praise God is what it is. A very point in the discussion of what the apostle is trying to get at here. Then Romans 12, uh, 15 verse 12 here. And again, <laughs> Isaiah, talking about Isaiah. Isaiah, there shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, and him shall the Gentiles trust. Uh, this comes from Isaiah 11 and verse number 10. Isaiah 11, 10. Uh, there shall be a root of Jesse. Root here is a reference to a descendant or one that should proceed from him uh, when he was dead. Uh, when a tree dies, we've got a good example of this on our, on our own property here. We had uh, the guy that uh, is doing our community service uh, try to trim back some of the the, the, the stumps, we had the trees taken out because the tree died. Well, the stumps are wanting to come back out. Okay? The roots are, roots are trying to come, come back out there because they retain life. When a, when a tree dies and falls, there may remain a root which shall retain life and which shall send up a sprout of a similar kind. And that, that's when the root of Jesse. Um, listen to Job 14, verse number 7. And it talks about this. It says, For there is a hope of a tree, if it be cut down, that it will sprout again, and that the tender branch thereof will not cease. Uh, that's Job 14, 7. So in relation to Jesse, though he should fall like an aged tree, and he died, okay? He died and David died, all right? Uh, yet his name and family should not be extinct. There would be a descendant who should rise and reign over the Gentiles. That's what it's talking about. There should be a root of Jesse. And of course, the Lord Jesus is called uh, also the root and the offspring of David, and David being uh, of, the, of Jesse. Okay, And he's called that in Revelation 22, 16, and Revelation 5, 5. Revelation 22, 16, Revelation 5, 5. Now, Jesse was the father of King David. We find that in 1 Samuel 17, 58. 1 Samuel 17, 58. And so uh, the Messiah was thus descended from Jesse. And uh, it says, And he shall he, he that shall rise, that is, like, like a sprout springs up from a decayed or fallen tree, Jesus thus rose from the family of David that had fallen into poverty and humble life in the time of Mary. Uh, he, he, he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles. Now, 
this is quoted from the uh, Septuagint, which is the uh, Greek, uh, the, the Greek uh, translation of the Old Testament. Remember, the, the, the uh, Old Testament is written in Hebrew. Well, during Jesus' time, Paul's time, there, there was a Septuagint version that was translated into, uh, into the Greek. And so, either this, whether you're talking the Septuagint or Hebrew, the, the, it expresses the idea of what the Apostle is getting at here. But this is quoted from uh, the Septuagint of Isaiah 11.10. And the Hebrew is, tra is translated as, which shall stand up for an ensign of the people. That is a, a standard to which they shall flock. And so... Uh, the substantial sense is retained, though it is not literally quoted. The, the idea of his reign over the Gentiles is one that is fully expressed. And we're not going to take time to turn there tonight for sake of time. But if you want to read about it, it's in Psalm 2. The, 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 uh, he will reign over the Gentiles as well. In him shall the Gentiles trust. That was the next phrase there. The design of this quotation is the same as the preceding, and that is to show that it was predicted in the Old Testament that the Gentiles would be made partakers of the privileges of the gospel. Now, the argument of the apostle here is, if this was designed by God, and it was, okay, this was designed by God, and then converts to Christianity from among the Jews should lay aside their prejudices and receive them as brethren, receive the, receive the Gentiles as brethren and, and uh, receive them um, and, and as ha having the same privileges of the gospel as themselves. The fact that the Gentiles would be uh, admitted to these privileges, the apostle um, had uh, covered that already. We saw that when we were in Romans chapter number 10 and Romans chapter number 11. Now, verse 13, and here's the third thing we see tonight, okay? And this is this. What the gospel did and or does for both Jew and Gentile. We're going to see what the gospel did and or does for both Jew and Gentile in verse number 13 uh, here says, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Let's break it down here. Now the God of hope. Aren't you glad our God inspires or produces hope? Amen? Remember we read a while ago in Ephesians, he said that you Gentiles were without hope because they didn't have God. You know, without hope, without God in this world. Well, with G bring Jesus in, they did have God. They did have hope. Uh, God inspires, produces hope in the believer. Hope meaning anticipation or the confident expectation. I like that better. Confident expectation is what hope means. The God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. Uh, look there at Romans 14. And verse number 17, uh, in the previous chapter there, it says, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Uh, uh, if they were filled with joy and peace, there would be no strife and contention, right? Where you find joy and peace at, and you're to be filled with that. I'm to be filled with that. Well, if we're filled with joy and peace, there is no contention to be had. No strife and no contention. Uh, and he, he fills us that in believing. The effect of believing is to produce this joy and peace. That you may abound in hope. That is, that your hope may be steadfast and strong in the Lord. Amen? Uh, through the power, by means of the, of the powerful operation of the Holy Spirit. We're talking about the power of God there. It's by His power alone that the believer has the hope of eternal life. It's not through any power of us. It's through the power of God. Listen to a couple other uh, scriptures here. Ephesians 1, verse 13 and 14. And whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also after that ye believed ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, 
which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. And then Romans 8, 24 says, For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why, why doth he yet hope for it? Amen. Um, now, let's look at verse 14, and we'll be done here. Uh, he says here, And I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye also are full of goodness, and filled with all knowledge, and able also to admonish one another. Now let's break this down. And I myself also, the, the apostle here, he's proceeding to show them why he had written this epistle uh, and, and to state his confidence in them. He had exhorted them to peace. He had opposed some of their strongest prejudices. And in order to secure their obedience to his exhortations here, he now shows them the deep interest which he had in their welfare, though he had never seen them before. Paul cared for them, even though he never seen them. Never, had never, never been to the church. Uh, he says, and I myself also am persuaded of you. He had never seen them, according to Romans 1, verses 10 through 13, but he had full confidence in them here. This confidence he had expressed more fully in the first chapter. And he says, I'm persuaded of you, my brethren. That's an address of affection. When we call folks brethren and my brother, that's a, that's a term of affection, isn't it? You know? uh, and uh, showing that he was not disposed to assume uh, an undue authority. You know, he's not throwing his apostleship around on this idea right here. Okay? He could, but he's, he's talking to them as brethren. Uh, he's not trying to lord it over their, their faith. But he was saying, look, I'm persuaded of you, my brethren, that you are full of are full of goodness. <laughs> Feel, filled with that word goodness, talking about kindness or benevolence in action. Uh, that is, they were disposed to obey uh, any just commands. Uh, you know, if, if, if he had uh, given them a command, he, he believed that they would follow that. Also, he recognized that any errors in their, their opinions or and conduct had not been the effect of stubbornness or perverseness. If they, and they just had not been taught. Okay? The reason why they, had the, they were still having issues with uh, uh, the, the Gentiles, the Gentiles and, and the Jews were having some issues one with another is because they hadn't been taught. When you're taught and you come to understand these things, you come to, you come to know they, well, we, we're brethren and we ought to be able to get along. Okay, man? There ought to be joy and peace. And so it wasn't a matter of stubbornness or perverseness, but uh, he said, uh, you're full of goodness, filled with all knowledge. That is, they had been instructed in the doctrines and duties of believers through what he wrote here, and he said, uh, able also to admonish one another. That is, they were so fully instructed in godly principles as to be able to give advice and counsel to each other if it was needed. And that's, that's the way we ought to be. I mean, we ought, to, we ought to learn good doctrine and be able to share good doctrine. Amen? And, and be able to, to... What's the first purpose of finding out doctrine? To change personally. Okay, man? We, we're, it's for us to abide by. But then we also to teach, teach others. Okay, man? We're, we're, we're to do that. And so we see the uh, Jesus is your Messiah. He's my Messiah. Amen. We might be different as night and day. But the Lord loved us both. He saved us both. Saved every one of us that are, are, are His. And He wants us to get along. Amen. Even though we might be a, a little hard to get along with at times. <laughs> we're to get along. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank You this evening for the, this blessed truth. Uh, given by the Apostle Paul. And I know, Lord, that, uh, uh, that we are yours and those that, uh, that trust, have trusted you as Lord and Savior. Lord, we, we uh, have the same love uh, for you. And Lord, help us to have the same love one for another as uh, the Apostle Paul, Paul points out here in uh, his writings. Lord, uh, I don't know how uh, you want uh, us as individuals to apply this, but I do know that 
you want us to, and, and Lord, may your Holy Spirit uh, direct us as, uh, as needed. And uh, we, we thank you for um, we thank you for our salvation. We thank you for our peace. And Lord, help us to have that peace and joy. And we have that peace and joy that comes from your Holy Spirit. There's no room for contention and strife. Lord, uh, contention and strife does not bring you glory. And we're to be, be bringing you glory. And the only way we can continue to bring you glory is when we maintain peace. Uh, and uh, Lord, uh, joy, have joy and peace in our lives. Help us with these things, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.